On September 9th, we're going to have the 592nd meeting of the Civil War Roundtable of New York. And our guest is going to be Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Peters, who wrote a series of excellent historical fiction books on the American Civil War. The latest is The Valley of the Shadow. How are you doing today, Colonel Peters? Well, I'm doing great because I get to talk to you. Okay. About my favorite subject. All right, the Civil War. Now, one of the great things, and, and, and again, you've written about this, but why write historical fiction? And I think the main reason is you bring the history to life. You bring the characters to life. Jubal Early is just a name in a history book to me, except when you start reading Valley of the Shadow. Well, certainly, I think there are two issues. The first is that we've taken serious history teaching out of our K-12 through uh, classes, and Americans, voters, don't know their history, <clears throat> or they maybe have a romanticized or a negative view of it. And what I'm trying to do in these books is to give people a very authentic and accurate picture of our Civil War. And that goes to the fact that these men, the men that fought, and with a few women, the, the men that fought the war, they were human beings. They were not bronze statues on plinths and pedestals. They weren't cardboard cutouts as you get in the movies. They were complex human beings with good days and bad days. By the closing years of the war, many of them have been wounded multiple times. These are the days before aspirin. They're cr chronically sick. Um, the big killer in the, in the civil war, our civil war was actually dysentery, aggravated diarrhea. So without overdoing that, what I'm trying to do is give people a, a picture of what these men went through, what they endured, north and south. And I think when you look at that, you come away with much more respect for them than idealizing them and pretending they were all perfect because, you know, perfect human beings don't exist. Who was your favorite character in Valley of the Shadow? Well, there, there are a number that I really like. John Gordon, who's just a fascinating Southern general, John Brown Gordon. But at the end of the day, my favorite character, both to write about in historical terms, was a, a middle-aged colonel known as Rudd Hayes. Rudd Hayes loved his soldiers, took care of them. They loved him back. He was a good fighter, smart. He did not love war. He hated war, but he felt he had to do his duty by his country. And Rudd Hayes, who is crucial in turning the tide at the Third Battle of Winchester, is a very personally brave man. He will go on in 1876 to become president as Rutherford B. Hayes. A name, you know, you might hear the name Rutherford B. Hayes as a punchline in a late night comic, comic spiel these days, but really, he was a fine president, and perhaps the most admirable man morally we've had since George Washington. And Rutherford B. Hayes, when he did run for president, he promised the American people that if elected, he would only serve one term. And after the original hanging Chad's election, the disputed election of 1876, he became president. And in the course of four years, people just thought he was great. He could have coasted to a second term. But he said, no, I promised the American people only one term. And he went back to Ohio dedicated the rest of his life to education for blacks and whites, to social causes, to bettering society, and his greatest pleasure for the rest of his life, apart from his loving his wife dearly, his greatest pleasure was hosting reunions for his soldiers. They were always well attended, and those the soldiers just, when soldiers will travel, in the days before, you know, before aircraft, the airplanes, and the days before motor cars, when they would travel long distances just to see Rudd Hayes, their former commander, that tells you a great deal. So Rudd Hayes has a dramatic war. He's wounded uh, badly, comes back, fights again. He loses a child to typhoid. As many generals actually lost children during the war, Jefferson Davis, president of the South, loses a child who falls off a balcony. <clears throat> but at any rate, the short answer is, uh, Rudd Hayes is the admirable guy, but then you have everything from John Brown Gordon, this gallant Southern rogue, the kind of guy that he's just absolutely charming, brilliant soldier, the kind of guy that would charm everybody at the dinner table in the restaurant, but he'd make sure he was in the men's room when the check came. You know, he's just, uh, and then Jubal Early, of course, who, you know, the Confederate commander in the valley, of uh, uh, the Shenandoah Valley in late 1864, I went into really the deep research for this book with a lower opinion of him than I had at the end. Because when I looked at the, this, this foul-mouthed, pro, profane, ill-tempered, unattractive man did, 
when he fights Phil Sheridan in those battles, he loses time and again. Comes close to winning, but he loses. But Sheridan chronically outnumbers him by two and a half, three, even four to one. And there's a reason Robert E. Lee did not remove early from command, and it's because nobody could have done better against those odds. So as you really explore it and you're writing and trying to put yourself in their place, which is what I had to do as an intelligence officer in my previous incarnation, you're trying to really get inside their heads. And when you do that, you don't necessarily come away liking Jubal early, but you come away respecting him, he, as so many of them did. He did his best with the hand he was dealt. Did you change your opinion of the Union commander, Phil Sheridan, during your research? Actually, I did a little bit. And though Sheridan could be a brilliant soldier, um, he's ultimately not a very, he's not a likable man. Um, He's the kind of guy that will always make sure to please the boss. He's ruthless with his peers. And he's very good to his subordinates. He picks good subordinates. He's a talent picker. uh, And he treats them well in the war. But then after the war, he really, you know, he drinks his own Kool-Aid. And by the time he writes his memoirs, he's rewriting history. And his old friend, George Crook, who will go on to be a great Indian fighter, he's, um, George Crook is crucial in, in the Valley Campaign twice. He makes crucial suggestions that win battles for Sheridan. And when Sheridan finally writes his memoirs a generation after the war, he, he basically writes Crook out of the story. But, you know, we're all human at the end of the day. Sheridan made a great contribution to the Union. Um, but there's another unsung hero in that when the book opens, The Valley of the Shadow covers these incredibly dramatic and, and fateful but lesser-known battles uh, in the Valley, but it opens in Maryland at Monocacy in, in July of 1864. People don't know about this anymore, but in, as late as eight, July 1864, a Confederate raid with 16 to 18,000 men almost seized Washington, D.C. And the raid only failed because one brave man out of favor who'd gotten a raw deal already, Union General Lew Wallace, basically defies orders, rounds up invalids, clerks, militiamen, a couple of troops of regular cavalry, dramatically outnumbered on the Monoxy River outside of Frederick, Maryland. He, I mean, I really... Even though he gets some last-minute reinforcements, he's still outnumbered three to one, and half of his forces, his men are, are, are green veterans. He makes a stand against Early's veterans on that field of Monoxy on the Monoxy Creek, on the Monoxy River, and he buys an entire day, fights brilliantly uh, for an entire day, loses the battle because he knows he's going to, he can't win, but he holds the Confederates up for a day, and as a result. It's amazing. It's like a f- watching a film to play this in your head. He, get, the Confederates, get to the site of the just completed Capitol Dome, just as Union reinforcements are pouring into the Washington fortifications within the same hour. And had Lewis Wallace not made that stand, he would have, you know, the Capitol would have fallen. The, the war could have turned out differently. Britain and France could have recognized the Confederacy. But he's not thanked for it, because he has political and bureaucratic enemies. Later on, though, successive presidents, starting with U.S. Grant, will reward him after the war. And Lou Wallace becomes governor of the New Mexico territories, deals with the Lincoln County Range War and Billy the Kid. He'll later go on to be our, we didn't call them ambassadors in those days, but essentially our ambassador to the Ottoman Sultan, the Sublime Court in Constantinople, Istanbul. And he's a huge hit uh, with, with the, the sultan. He becomes the sultan's first Western friend and advisor. That's just a remarkable performance. But what do we remember Walt, Lou Wallace for? Of course, he wrote the best-selling novel of the tw- uh, American novel of the 19th century, Ben Hur. Never been out of print. Remarkable people. Well, we don't know these people anymore. And north and south, there is just remarkable men who fight heroically for their chosen cause, or the cha- or in some cases the cause that chooses them. Jubal Early did not believe in slavery. He did not want any part of secession, but he was a Virginian, and when Virginia went out, like Robert E. Lee, he went with his state. And by the end of the war, he just hates Yankees bitterly. He'll be the, the, the great lost cause propagandizer and proselytizer. But people change. The war becomes, by 1864, it becomes absolutely brutal. It's not romantic anymore. And that's one of the reasons I think that so few novelists have tried to address it. 
you know, except for the crater in Petersburg um, in, uh, in July of 1864, you don't read about 1864 because the battles are ugly and modern and violent and brutal, and the men are under stress and the armies are breaking down. And so what I'm trying to do is give, give Americans back their history, the history they've forgotten. And so, again, these, they're novels, but they're extremely accurate historically. Even the enlisted men are real people. Now, there's another president who was involved in the Shenandoah campaign. You want to tell the audience about him? Well, there's a, 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 another guy we have uh, misconceptions about, a protege of Rutherford B. Hayes. They start out in the same Ohio regiment. And this is a young man who is kind of dreamy-eyed, and he's very brave, but he's the kind of guy that starts out as an enlisted man, becomes an officer, he falls in love with a girl in every village uh, where the um, the regiments bivouac and later the brigade and the division. And his name was William McKinley, young Will McKinley. And, of course, if we know McKinley at all, we think of him as the walrus-looking guy who fought the Spanish-American War. But people, I mean, when we know their whole lives. I mean, perhaps the biggest surprise for me when I was researching the book was Rutherford B. Hayes. I knew uh, generally about him. I knew his war record. But I really studied the man, Rutherford B. Hayes. I thought, my God, Americans should know this man. Uh, he was a, a, a wonderful president, a, a war hero, a man of honor, a politician of absolute integrity. How many times do we see that? <laughs> you got me there. Um, another character you have, which you focused on a little bit, George Armstrong Custer. Well, Custer is fascinating. Um, he's the opposite of Rutherford B. Hayes in the sense that Hayes does his duty, but he never, never loves war. He gets excited in battles. The, the adrenaline rush, is, rush comes on, but he's not a war lover. Whereas Custer just loves to fight. He loves war. He, he dreads the thought that when the war is over, he might collapse into obscurity. This, I mean, this is a man that at age 24 was promoted uh, just before his 24th birthday, I think. He, he, he jumps from captain to brigadier general. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Just on the eve of Gettysburg, he's promoted to brigadier general. He's a daring and brilliant cavalry commander. Uh, has a touch of the psychopath, certainly, about him, but he's incredibly brave. Uh, he just survives attacks he never should have survived. And Custer's absolutely fascinating on many levels, but one is that at the Little Bighorn, when he tried splitting his forces to get around, you know, have one force hit the enemy and the other guys come around the flank, that is the exact tactic that worked for him time and again in the Civil War. The difference is, in the Civil War, he was pretty careful about doing good intelligence. He's sometimes rash, but normally he gets his scouts out, he knows what he's getting into, and at the Little Bighorn, big, little bighorn he didn't bother to scout, and he paid the price. But... But these men, I mean, Custer's colorful, Rutherford B. Hayes is the kind of guy that would, you know, wear a black suit, not a plaid suit. Uh, they're, they're so different. And then, of course, the Southerners, John Brown Gordon, who with his, his brave wife is one of the great love stories of the war. Um, Jubal Early, or a young private George Nichols in the 61st Georgia, who left us uh, maybe not brilliant literature, but a great memoir of what it was like to fight in those battles. And so when you follow George, Private George Nichols through these battles of um, Third Winchester or Fisher's Hill, Tom's Brook, Cedar Creek, you're really seeing what it was like to be an enlisted soldier with no shoes and fighting through. And by the way, Rutherford B. Hayes, his big um, nightmare in the Civil War is poison ivy. He's really allergic to poison ivy. And so when he's tramping through those brambles initially in West Virginia, then in the Shenandoah Valley, He's watching out for the Rebs, but he's really watching out for Poison Ivy. And we, those are these human things. When you know something like that about somebody, it humanizes them. And too often the history books, as fine as they can be, leave those things out. And, and it's important because we need to understand where we came from if we're to more acutely and aptly shape where we're going. For instance, you've heard, I've heard, we've all heard people say, I mean, people today say, our country's never been so divided. 750,000 Americans, North and South, died in our Civil War. I would suggest that we were slightly more divided then. I think you have a point on that. And I don't know how you would get these personalities out except in historical fiction. And I compliment you for that. You, you do a great job. I've enjoyed reading Valley of the Shadow. And we, we look forward to seeing you at the Civil War Roundtable 
on September 9th. Doors open at uh, 530 at the 3 West Club. That's National Republican Women's Club at 3 West 51st Street in Manhattan. And I really look forward to speaking to that crowd. Great bunch of folks. Great Civil War roundtable. Oh, yes, it is. And we look forward to seeing you there.